Are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price? For high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Takeyoursupplements.com. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 144. Today we're in for such a special treat. Sharon Lipinski is an amazing uh, certified corporate wellness specialist and she teaches uh, some fantastic techniques for really transforming our life one step at a time. I'm so thrilled to have you here today because what you're going to share really can rock our worlds. Now, when you think uh, corporate wellness specialist, you think, man, I mean, to be able to be hired by major corporations to help transform the efficiency of the workplace, um, you have you have some skill. I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> And we've had a great time talking before we hit record. And um, I'm really, really excited to bring you to my listeners. You know, a lot of people have um, approached me to put commercials on my show. And, and I feel like the listeners are my family and I want to protect them, you know? So I, I, I same with my, my guests, I, I don't want to get interview people that would steer them the wrong way. So I have to say this, um, with with such a huge heart, I'm really excited you're here today because if if we follow the techniques you're going to teach us today, we could really transform our life. So I'm going to open the floor up to you. Please start by sharing your story. You have a wonderful story and it'll help us to understand um, why you became the certified corporate wellness specialist that you are today. Well, sure. I think I have a story that a lot of people can identify with, that I was in a high pressure job that I hated. And I was working 60 hours or more a week in this job. And eventually my body began to, my body and my mind began to rebel on me. And I started getting panic attacks. And I knew it was job related because I was miserable and I hated what I did. And I lived with these panic attacks for about a year. And then one day I was at work and I heard myself say to a colleague, you know, if I have to do this for the rest of my life, I would rather kill myself. And fortunately, I heard those words and I realized like, this is a warning sign. <laughs> I, I need to make some changes in my life. And I quit my job and I spent the next year trying to discover myself because I spent so much time working. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what interested me and I certainly had no idea what was next. So I read and I traveled and I went on spiritual retreats and meditation retreats. And like, I still had no idea what the answer was. And I got this idea that, you know, I, if I just spent an entire month alone looking out over stormy ocean, that in that sense of isolation, I was going to figure stuff out. So I rented a house on the coast of Oregon for the entire month of November. And while I was there, my dogs and I would walk down the hill and there was a convenience store at the bottom of the hill. And there was an older gentleman who was living there as a caretaker. And since it was November, there weren't enough tourists to justify keeping it open. So he was always alone and we would talk for a little bit and then I'd continue on my walk. So I got to know a little bit about him and I learned that he was a recovering drug addict whose family no longer spoke to him. I learned that he spent most of his evenings alone watching TV and I knew that he was going to be alone for Thanksgiving. So very nervously, very hesitatingly. I invited him to spend Thanksgiving with me at a Chinese restaurant in town. And honestly, actually, I hoped he'd say no. This made me nervous. I, I wanted to feel good for asking, but I didn't really want to do. I don't know if you ever put yourself in that position. But here I was. He said, yes, I'm committed. So I pick him up on Thanksgiving evening. We drive into town and we share plates of sesame chicken and beef with broccoli while he talked about his kids. And as I sat there looking across the table, 
I didn't see a stranger. I saw a man who regretted his past and a father who was proud of his kids. And I saw a human being who just very rarely had somebody to talk to, who cared about him and what was important to him. And that was the moment that I finally got it. Like It really is these small, everyday acts of generosity that make life worth living because this was a little thing for me. This was a couple hours of my time. It was $30, but it was a really big deal for him. And I had to kind of take a reality check of my own life and say, okay, you know what, Sharon, you're not giving to other people, not as much as you want, not as much as you're capable of, and you're not really giving that much to yourself either. So what's going on here? Because I was honest, I was kind, I was hardworking, but why wasn't I giving? And I think I wasn't giving for a lot of the reasons um, that you know you and maybe some of your listeners can identify with. Part of it was that I was so busy. I was so busy that I didn't have time to notice a situation. And if I noticed, I didn't have time to do anything about it. Or I was scared. I was scared that I was going to be taken advantage of or look stupid or do something wrong. And I kept telling myself, you know what, someday, someday I'm going to have plenty of time, plenty of energy, plenty of money. And then, then I will start giving as much as I wanted to give. And it was that moment when I realized like that was not going to cut it anymore, that I was going to figure out how to make giving a regular daily part of my life. And, and what did, so you're, you're there going, I, I need to do this every day. Uh, yeah. I, and, and I love, I love that, you know, the someday, the waiting for someday, cause we all do that. You know, when I have more money, then I'm going to start that diet or then I'm going to go on vacation or when I, you know, when my kids, when my kids go to college, then I'm going to do this. And it's good to, you know, put goals in the future, but oftentimes we, um, stop doing the things we want to do and, and put them in this unknown point in the future instead of going, you know what? It doesn't matter how much money I have or how much time I have. It's important to me and I'm going to figure out how to make it work. Like the last guy I interviewed wanted to, he didn't have any money. He was 19 and he wanted, or he was a, you know, a teenager just out of high school and he wanted to study with this doctor. And so he hitchhiked across country and lived in a tent in that doctor's backyard in order to study with him. Like talk about tenacity. He wow. didn't go, he didn't say one day when I have money, then I'll, that, that level of dedication going, you know, I want this, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. And there's nothing, there's no time and money waiting in the future to fulfill this. I'm going to do it now. So you said, it's, I realize it's what's missing from my life is giving because giving this act of generosity, this giving actually gives more to us. Isn't that that weird paradox that the more, the more even, and not necessarily the more we give, like all of a sudden we're penniless, but, but that when we give, we receive more. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about giving. And, and though, I always remind people that we have to be generous to ourselves as well. That it's just as important that we give to other people because if we don't, we end up giving on credit. And eventually that bill comes due and it's not pretty. Um, so what happened for me next was like, okay, so if I want to give, how am I going to do that? So I started a nonprofit called Virtual Giving Circles, and what we do is we put $25 a month into whatever cause you care about. So we have three different circles. We have one around veterans, one around ending poverty, and one around helping pets. Um, so you choose your circle. You give $25 a month, and then every three months we give it away. So what happens is, is one, we can give a lot more money together than we can do alone. Um, and we have a donation committee who researches our charities before we give. So we can be really confident that we're directing it uh, to a place that's going to make a big difference with it. And what I did without even realizing what I was doing is I made philanthropy a habit, $25 a month, one hour a month right? Super simple, super easy. And then I read a book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit. And I realized, wow, what applies for philanthropy applies for every other area of my life too. That if I can make all these things habits, then I can do the right things without having to think about it. Because 
there are a lot of things in our life that we have to think about, but some things we don't. We don't really need to think about exercising. That should be something that just happens every day. Eating the right foods, being a good listener, spending quality time with your family. All of these behaviors can be essentially programmed in and happen on autopilot so that they happen. We don't have to force ourselves to do it. And then we have time and energy left over for those things that we do have to think about. So that's, I'm on a mission. I want people to stop thinking about the things that they don't have to think about. Let's get those things programmed in. Perfect. I love it. You know, we have habits in our life that are good and habits in our life that maybe aren't um, propelling us forward towards the goals we want, right? So you can call them bad habits. So we, we, we have habits instilled and those are the things we don't think about, right? Like going for the sweets or going to Starbucks or those can, might be bad habits uh, or sitting and watching TV the second we get home or turning on the TV and falling asleep to it every night. You know, those might be bad habits that we developed. Um, and a good habit might be that we, the you know, families that sit at the dinner table every night, no matter what, they have dinner and they share their day with each other. And that's, they don't even think about it, they just do it. And for other families that sit in front of the TV and eat, that is, uh, that seems like a foreign habit. And it seemed like a, like kind of a big deal to make that transition. But I, my family did. And I, that's why I got to say is that it, at first, it took about a month. It was so hard because I, for many years, would sit in front of the TV and eat. And it just that was such a strong habit. But now that we have a son and having a kid can sometimes be like the best thing that's ever happened to to a family because it all of a sudden now I'm like, well, I'd sit in front of the TV and like and do kind of a bad habit that's hurting me. But when it comes to my son, I'm not going to do that for my two year old. So no, he has mm -hmm. to sit at a table and, and he should be raised by parents that want to sit with him and eat with him and talk to him. And so we, we made that transition to the table. And now it's now we eat all three meals that are at our table because we work from home and so we can do that now i'm cooking more whole foods eating more vegetables it kind of this one little habit has now spilled into causing a bunch of other like micro habits where we're getting more vegetables in and we're communicating more and we're sharing more and we're loving more so it's really neat what happens when we when we switch to one habit it can kind of have this this um you know domino effect yeah, absolutely. There's so much good stuff in there and what you just said. So I want to point out just a couple of them. So Duke University estimates that up to 40% of our day we're engaged with habit, which I think is huge. That means nearly half of our waking hours, we are not paying attention to what we're doing while we're doing it. And we're talking about habits of behavior like exercise um, and eating right, but also behaviors of thought feeling confident, feeling grateful, thinking positively, these are habits. And then we have habits of relationships because by and large, we interact with people in pretty much the same way, right? We talk about the same kinds of things together. We do the same sort of things together. So these are all habits. Um, and yeah, so if we can start, uh, and you absolutely want to start small, um, and, and probably, uh, you know, it might be useful at this point in time to talk about willpower, why it's so important to start small and with one habit, like you did with the table, because it does springboard, but often, you know, what people want to do is they're like, okay, wholesale, I got to change everything about my life. And they've got a list of like five major behaviors <laughs> that they want to change. Um, and they don't succeed at any of them. Um, so it's really important that we start small uh, and start strategically with kind of these keystone habits that can kind of cascade and impact many areas of our life. Wonderful. Well, we definitely want to do that. We want to have a positive impact on every area of our life. And we, yeah, we oftentimes try to take on too much. I, I know that I've self-sabotaged numerous times because it's like the, the new, the new, the new year's effect, right? Oh, I can't believe it's 2017. Well, gee, like last year I was going to set out to save, you know, save money and exercise more and, you know, eat more vegetables and lose weight or whatever we set out to do. And all of a sudden a year goes by and so now it's New Year's and then we, we set like a bunch of goals. Okay, joining the gym again and I'm going to go on this detox and I'm going to, you know, not eat meat or whatever. And we make, we, we try to like change too many things at once and it kind of implodes on ourselves within a few days. It does. And I think part of it's because we have this huge misconception of what willpower is. So we think, gosh, you know, I, it's my fault. I just got to buckle down. I got to stick to it. If I only had more willpower, then I could, 
you know, accomplish all these changes in my life. So let's talk about what willpower is, because you've probably had this experience. You know that sometimes calling on your willpower is easy. Somebody, some, sometimes when somebody brings a box of donuts into the office and they're sitting in the break room, but earlier that week you said, you know what, I'm eating healthy and you walk right past those box of donuts and it doesn't even phase you. But sometimes you walk past the break room and then you kind of pause and you look in, you're like, oh, there's, there's some donuts in there. <laughs> and then you talk yourself down. I was like, I'm just going to have a half a donut. And then, I'm gonna, then you finish the donut, right? So sometimes our willpower is there for us. And sometimes it's not. Well, why is that? Well, willpower is a form of mental energy. And we use this mental energy to control our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our performance. We are using our willpower constantly all day long. So it helps to think about willpower like the tank of gasoline in your car, right? So you get one tank of willpower for everything, every decision that you make. Um, every time you force yourself to say the nice thing when you kind of wanted to be snarky. Every time you force yourself to answer that email that's been hanging out in your inbox for a couple of weeks, like all of these, you know, hundreds of tiny decisions that we're making is draining that tank of willpower. So sometimes your willpower isn't there for you because you've just plain used it up. And like the gas in your car, you've got to refill it before it's there for you again. Right. I was just thinking like, you know, I, I've been on so many diets and, you know, I don't cheat for in breakfast. Like who cheats at breakfast? You know what I mean? Like who goes, oh, screw it. It's been a rough day. I've only been up for five minutes. I'm going to have the toast. I'm going to eat the toast instead of my protein shake. Most people can like stick with their diet through breakfast. Right. And, and even through lunch, it's at like th maybe 3 p.m. and that snack machine's calling them or Starbucks is calling them. Or maybe it's after dinner, 11 o'clock at night. You already had your like protein and salad and you now you're hungry again and you know you should have gone to bed an hour ago but you're kind of up staring at the fridge going you know just whatever I'm just going to eat whatever and maybe your your husband brought home some cookies and and there's no willpower left and all of a sudden you've consumed the entire box of cookies because it's like 11 at night or maybe one in the morning right it's so what's up with that that we you know it's it, the the willpower is only lasting a certain amount of time it, it I, I know I'm just going to speak from my personal experience. I would then beat myself up. What's wrong with mm -hmm. me? I'm broken. I'm wrong. I'm you know miserable. And because I thought that there's something wrong with me that I couldn't stick with it. But what you're saying is that is that you you were if I set five to try to change five habits at once, I'm using up my willpower so fast in the day that, um, you know, that by, by 3 PM, I don't, I just don't have any more. And, and then it's like, it's so easy to, to like give up and fall back into those old habits. Yeah. So you've either used up your will tank, your willpower tank by using it up, but you also may have drained that tank because of physical stress. So willpower is a form of mental energy, but it's actually fueled by your body and it runs on glucose and sleep. So if you're tired and hungry, right? <gasps> right. Right. Like, <laughs> oh my God, I had no willpower when I was like with my baby, you know, he's waking me up five times a night to, to, to eat. And I was pretty much sleeping only 90 minutes at a time. Yeah. There was no, I was, I was a walking zombie. There was no willpower there at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Or it's been drained with emotional stress. And I'm sure nobody who's listening to this call has any stress in their life. But <laughs> if they did have stress and you know, you're worried about something, you know, what's I, you're having some relationship problems or you're having trouble paying your bills or you're thinking, gosh, what am I going to do if I go to this event and there's food there? I know that I shouldn't eat. Every time you pick that thought up and you put it back down, you are using up willpower. It makes it harder for you to resist temptation the next time. Mm. Have you ever had that experience? Absolutely. That makes so much sense. So instead of beating myself up and going, you know, gosh, I'm so weak. I'm, you know, I should be stronger, especially comparing myself to like, for example, the biggest loser, right? You see these like a bunch of overweight people and one season later, they're all like the ideal body weight, you know, but they, and, and they can just miraculously eat celery and exercise eight hours a day. Cause that's what they show on camera and, you know, drop 50 pounds a week. You know, it's just like, so, so they show, they don't show necessarily 
the what, what's going on behind the scene, like how how much willpower they're using up and how and how difficult it is. I mean, sometimes they show a little bit of that emotion, but but for you know to make it into a neat little package of a TV show and. There's Biggest Losers is just one of them. There's tons of those shows out there, those transformational shows where you don't really see that there's so um, so much going on inside the person when it comes to when it comes to willpower, and uh, and we often then beat ourselves up, and so we have to realize and and I I need to be easier on myself, forgive myself, and go hey you know I need to choose like like you were saying choose one habit at a time. I need to forgive myself. I need to realize that I, you know I have a quota of willpower. And if I want to be successful at in, in installing a new habit, I, I need to recognize that. So not don't use it up with a bunch of like, don't make sure I sleep. Right. So I, yep. I still have more willpower. Make sure that I'm not under too much stress. Um, make sure I'm not under too much physical stress. Uh, so when we're setting uh, new habits, don't do it at a time when we know we're going to be under physical stress, emotional stress or getting very little sleep. Right. Yes. And you can also see here why changing food habits can be especially tr tr troublesome because if you are not eating enough and that's hampering your willpower account, but you're, I mean, the part of the thing is, is that I don't eat as much, right? So you can see sometimes this, this can be really tricky. So the good news is that when something is a habit, we bypass this willpower account. You don't have to think, you don't have to decide, you don't have to force yourself to do it, right? You don't talk yourself out of your morning cup of coffee. You don't forget to shower in the morning. These things are happening automatically unconsciously. And the good news is, is that if you can create a bad habit, you can create a good habit. The process is exactly the same. They form the same way. Um, so maybe it would be helpful if we kind of got into the nitty gritty of what a habit is. Do you think that would be? Absolutely. Let's do it. So what is a habit? All right. So a habit is a routine of behavior that is re repeated regularly and tends to occur unconsciously. But what we're talking about is an actual physiological process. Inside your brain, there's a neural pathway that connects the beginning of an action to the end of an action. And when you do something new for the first time, your brain has to work really hard at this. All of the neurons along that pathway are gonna fire. But you do it the next time, you're a little more familiar with it, a little easier, the brain's not gonna work quite as hard, we're gonna have a few less neurons fire. So you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and each time fewer and fewer neurons fire. When something is a habit, only the neurons at the beginning and at the end of the action fire and the rest of that time, you're on autopilot. Right. Repetition is the mother of habit. And you've actually had this experience in your life. You've done it several times. But a really obvious example is driving. You Do you remember learning how to drive? Yeah, I, I remember being in the car and kind of like not really knowing what I was doing and being really afraid. Yep. And you had to pay really close attention and, oh, there's lights and there's people walking and there's cars. And I learned how to drive on a stick shift. So not only was I doing all of that, but I was like, okay, I got to press in the clutch and I got to put the car in gear. And then I got to press in on the gas while I'm releasing on the clutch with the right pressure. Like in the beginning, all I could do was focus on driving. But now have you ever had the experience where you get in your car in your driveway and you arrive at your destination and you think, uh, how did I get here? Absolutely. Yeah. You can just kind of, it just becomes muscle memory, right? You can just drive somewhere or, uh, my husband will be going somewhere else and he'll, and he will turn into the wrong road because it's, we always go this one direction, for example, to go to the grocery store. And, but this time we were going to the doctor, but it's on the same road. You just have to turn right to go to the doctor, left to go to the, the grocery store. And he would turn right in and park at the grocery store. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, it's autopilot. I just wasn't yeah. even thinking, you know, but he knew we were going to the doctor, but we do that where we'll just all of a sudden drive home and we're like, I don't even remember the last five minutes of driving. I know I was driving, but becomes it becomes so unconscious uh, because like you said, D Duke University figured out that f at least 40% of our day is habit, is unconscious, right? So um, I love that because we don't think we, we're not squeezing the steering wheel going, okay, uh, check my mirror every five seconds. Okay, uh, I have to change lanes. What do I do? Uh, check my mirror. Okay, 
put the signal on. Okay, change lanes. Okay, turn my signal off. Okay, check my mirror again. Like that's that's how it was but when we were learning how to drive, but now we just do it. We don't think about it. Exactly. The brain loves habits because it's literally the path of least resistance and your brain wants to be an effective use of energy. Mm. So if it can bypass all of that stuff, it doesn't have to do, it's going to take that path. And, uh, you know, the rest of the time it's freeing you up for more important things. Like, well, what do I have to get when I go to the grocery store? And what calls do I make when I get into the office? Like your brain loves habits. So what we want to do is hack into that and help ourselves create the right habits. It's comforting to know that the brain's, um, it's, 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 standard process like it what it wants to do it wants to help you create a habit it it, 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 because sometimes I feel like my brain's against me (laughs) you know like I feel like I'm going uphill right because it's such a conscious like if you take yourself back to learning how to drive I did not feel like my brain was with me especially learning stick shift right it was just like so many things I had to do at once and uh, and and remember just like learning how to play tennis you know you have to remember your footwork you have to remember you know your posture you have to remember like how how um, firmly you're holding the racket you have to remember to keep your eye on the ball I mean there's just so many things you have to remember to do right or golfing right with a golf swing you could sit with a pro and they'll tell you 25 things you need to do to have the perfect swing and you have to remember all of them in one swing in like one in three seconds you have to have do all these 25 processes and at first you feel like your body's against you you feel clumsy uh you you know you're, you feel like your brain's against you because it's not clicking and you have to consciously do every and remember every single thing um but then fast forward to when you your your brain made it a habit it's like you can just you know you're you could just be daydreaming and, and and have the perfect golf swing or you could just be kind of you know in the moment daydreaming and all of a sudden make the perfect serve in tennis or drive wherever you want so um i want to make coffee uh you know the, the habit of coffee be uh like the habit of eating more vegetables or going to the gym because those things you know are going for walks not necessarily going to the gym but just more physical exercise and so for the listeners who want to uh have a health health healthy habits it, it develop healthy habits and they know they know they can they, they they never forget their coffee in the morning so they clearly know that they can make a habit how do we how do we go from, okay, setting a habit going, okay, setting a goal, for example, of I want to walk every day to make sure that it becomes as unconscious and as predictable as we drink our coffee in the morning, or we take a shower, like you said. All right. So it's a five step process and it begins with understanding the anatomy of a habit. So when we think of a habit, we often think making coffee, right? That's my habit, but a a habit, that's the action part of the habit. There's actually three parts. There's the trigger, there's the action, and then there's the reward. In other words, something has caused you to act in a certain way in order to get a particular benefit. So your habit of going into the bathroom to brush your teeth will begin um, often with your alarm clock going off. That could be a trigger. Or your habit, the, the routine of brushing your teeth in the morning, is with turning on the light in the bathroom. Have you ever had the experience where you you have a power failure in the house, the lights don't work, and you walk into the bathroom, and the first thing you do is you flip the lights, <laughs> right? You know it's not going to go on. <laughs> right. Or, or we actually just had a power outage yesterday because everyone is like record high temperatures. Everyone turned on the AC, and so the power went out. And, uh, and of course we know we have no Wi-Fi, right? But all three of us in the home, like grabbed our cell phones and we're, or, or, or our iPad or whatever or computer. And, uh, or I said, okay, I'm going to go work on my computer. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have Wi-Fi. What are you thinking? Uh, yeah, it's just so funny. Being- triggered constantly things in our environment emotions are triggering us people are triggering us like we're being triggered all the time so something triggers us we do a particular action and we do it for particular benefit we get something out of it Um, and so that is the the structure that we want to hack into and designing when like we know like okay if i want to create an exercise habit i have to address each part of this anatomy separately Now, step one, what I always do, though, is get really in touch with why is this important? You know, because there are 
hundreds, I don't know, thousands of habits that we could create, but sometimes they're not really that important. We're doing it because somebody else thinks it's important Mm. or I should do this, right? So we want to spend a little time getting really in touch with like, what, why is this habit important in my life? How is it helping me be a better parent, a better spouse, a a better, better in my work? Like, how is this habit really serving me? in the roles that I want to perform and show up uh, at my highest self in, in life, how is it helping me, um, you know, be more creative or, you know, whatever it is that I value in life, how is it really serving me? So that's step one, really get clear why this habit, um, and why now, now step two is where we start to hack into this anatomy. And step two, I like to start at the action because it is the most obvious part of the habit. And a lot of New Year's resolutions fall right here before they even get started because they have not successfully designed an action step. And there are three parts to a successful action step. First, it has to be as simple as possible with as few moving parts as possible, with you having to make as few decisions as possible. This is coming into this willpower thing, right? We do not want to have to make decisions. So how ridiculously easy can we make it? And and because remember I said that uh, repetition is the mother of habit, as you start to do this action and you lay a little bit of the neural pathway and you do it again and the neural pathway is getting a little deeper, a little stronger, you can increase this complexity at any point in time as you're starting to feel more confident. But in the beginning, it's got to be super simple, uh, super easy for you to do. Now, the second part is that it has to be really, really specific. So getting healthy right? That could mean anything. And I will often talk with people who are trying to change their eating habits. And they're like, well, I'm going to eat a healthy lunch. Okay. Well, let's get super, super specific about what that means. Are you going to exercise for 15 minutes of cardio Monday and Wednesday and Friday? Are you going to have a salad for lunch? Right. But this applies not just to exercise and eating. If you want to create, say a journaling habit, you're going to say my specific action is to write 15 minutes in my journal. But it has to be specific, concrete. You have to know exactly, exactly what you're going to do. Again, because we don't want to use up that willpower on deciding it. I already have to know what I'm going to do. And then the third key is that this has to be an attainable action step. It has to be something that you can actually do. So if you want to exercise and, you know, walking around the block is difficult, the first step is not to start running. Build your habit slowly and each step of the way is an action that you can actually take. So I'm going to start with walking around the block twice and then I'm going to jog around the block once. But each time you're taking a step that you can actually take. Does that make sense? I hope you're enjoying this interview so far. We'll get back to it in a minute. But first, I wanted to share a message that has been on my mind to bring to you. You know, I started this journey because I wanted not only to help you experience amazing health, but I wanted to find it myself. And what better way to find something than to learn from experts and also to teach it. Through this last year of doing the holistic podcast known as Learn True Health, I have had the honor of connecting with over a hundred experts in the field of natural medicine. One thing that's really inspired me is there's a group of people, in fact, it's the fastest growing career field in the United States right now, and that is health coaches. I didn't really appreciate them or understand what their role was until after I started interviewing enough of them. And I found that health coaches have an amazing ability to impact someone's life far beyond what medical doctors are doing right now. You see, you might see your medical doctor once you're already sick, right? The old paradigm of healthcare is to go to a doctor when you're sick, uh, wait till your body breaks down or show signs of symptoms, and then you need a doctor's intervention. Not many people, now maybe you do because you're smart and because you're a Learn to Health listener, you probably do this to some extent, 
go to a doctor on a regular basis and, and get great health advice from them? Do you go to your doctor and, he, and they t say, hey, you know, I noticed that uh, you could really use more vitamin C and, and I think you should eat this. And, and I really think that uh, based on your body weight and based on your, your blood work that um, a, a few more minutes of cardiovascular exercise and here, why don't I go ahead and show you how to do it? Why don't I go ahead and, oh, I've got some recipes that are really going to help you because I see in your blood work that you could really benefit from these nutrients. Why don't I go ahead and spend an hour with you and help you do that so we can get you on the right track? No, no medical doctor does that. And if they do, God, hold on to them and definitely tell, tell everyone about them. I don't know any medical doctor that has the ability to sit down with you on a regular basis and not only find out about your your lab work but also find out about your 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 health in every aspect of your life you see if you have a really really stressful job and you have no outlet for that that can bleed into other areas of your life and, and lead to ill health right so what I'm learning about health coaches is that they help their clients to gain balance and holistic health in every area of their life. They come to you wherever you are, whether you're still eating McDonald's and you're 400 pounds and you're sitting on the couch, whether you're uh, driving a truck and, and you just don't have time for exercise and you, and you really do want to eat healthy, but you're always like 100 miles away from any whole foods, or whether you're you know, already gluten-free and already eating organic, and you could just really use some extra advice to take your health to the next level. Wherever you are, a health coach meets you where you are. And then what they do is they slowly add step-by-step step the most powerful but, but manageable changes slowly that make the biggest difference in your life. And they, they help you to find out what it is that you need most that's going to make the biggest difference in your life. And so the more I learn about health coaches, the more I realize that we need more health coaches in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia. We need more uh, help, this kind of help where someone can be our health advocate, where they can hold our hand, where they can take the time to slowly teach us the things that we wish our parents and our grandparents had taught us, We that the things that we wish we had learned in high school, the things that should be taught in home ec, right? And unfortunately aren't. The things, the lessons that we want to learn so that we can pass these lessons on and these healthy habits on to our children and uh, to our future generations. Now is the tipping point. You may have heard the scary statistic that our children's generation now has a slower, a smaller life expectancy than we do. Can you imagine if, if we're meant to live to be, for example, 75 years old, our, our children might only live to be 68. This is very scary. The fact that diabetes and prediabetes, one in three people have blood sugar issues. The scary statistic that one in two men in their lifetime will experience cancer. One in three women in their lifetime now will experience cancer. These are these are statistics that need to be stopped and only you can do that. So, you know, if you're the type of person that knows that you could benefit from it, I highly recommend checking out a health coach. Now, I I'm actually in a health coaching program, becoming a certified health coach. And in six months, I will be a certified health coach. And I am absolutely loving this program. I'm halfway through the program. And I'm, I'm sending this message to you, not only for those who want to make changes in their life, but I know there's a listener out there who is looking for a new career, who's looking to shift their life. Now, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition was started over 25 years ago by Joshua Rosenthal. You can go back and listen to my interview with Joshua Rosenthal, which, I mean, he is my hero. He's absolutely amazing. I, I recommend listening to his interview. He started this actually for women. Now, he has men in his course, in, and, you know, I love seeing and hearing that men are getting into the health coaching field, but Joshua actually started the Institute for Integrative Nutrition for women because he saw that there was an imbalance in the workforce that women um, had less opportunities 25 years ago to be able to live their passion and be mothers and maybe work from home 
And as a health coach, you can do that. You can still be a mom. You can still have a career. You can still be a full-time mom. You can still homeschool. Whatever you want to do, you can fit health coaching into your life, however you see fit. It's amazing. Um, What I also love about Institute for Integrative Nutrition is that they also have a business courses. So not only are you learning how to be an exceptional health coach, but you're also learning how to hit the ground running however you want, whether you want to do full-time or part-time, whether you want to take on one client a week, a month, whether you want a hundred clients, they teach you how to structure your business, how to market yourself in a way that comes from your heart, comes from authenticity, comes from integrity. I have never been more inspired by an institute in my life. So for the listener out there that has been seeking, that has been looking for their life purpose, that when they think about the possibility of helping someone, of helping people, they get teary eyed. You know, every time I think about people who are hurting, that I, I that I could I could impact their life, that I could help them, I just start crying, uh, tears of joy and inspiration. I want to help people, and so if you like me are are inspired by helping people, and you really are passionate, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know anything about health. Um, you don't have to be an expert. That's fine. You you don't have to have a degree. You can start as a student with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And they'll teach you everything you need. And you can do it in your spare time. Do the course in your spare time while you're a full-time mom or while you're working full-time or whether maybe you're still a student. It. I love how they, they really organize. And they spent years. I mean, they've been teaching it for 25 years. They've been They've organized the material. It's all online so you can be anywhere in the world. There are students all around the world. So if, if, if you're the listener that I'm talking to about wanting to shift your career, or add to your career, maybe you're already in the health field, you just want to increase your knowledge, or maybe you just have a calling and you want to try it out, please check out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Go to their website. It's IIN, Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Check them out. Give them a call and ask for, you can get a, a download to their, their course, their curriculum. You can even do one of their classes for free to check it out, to see if it's, it's a match for you. When you go to enroll, mention you heard it from me, Ashley James, Learn Your Health podcast, because I have aligned myself with them to make sure that you get a special. I want to, I want to hook you up. Any of my listeners who go through their program, get a special from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And also, I want you to tell me. I want you to email me, ashley at learntruehealth.com. Join our Facebook group. You know, just search Learn True Health in Facebook. Join our group. I want you to contact me and tell me you're going through the program. I want to support you in your success. Uh, If you have any questions or you just want to tell me how amazing it is, I have some great listeners that have already gone or have begun going through their program and they all love it and I just I love creating this community so if this is something you think would be interesting to you even if anything I've mentioned is remotely interesting if you go to learntrehealth.com on the sidebar you'll see um, halfway down just scroll halfway down you'll see that there's uh, in the widget section, a place where you can click to uh, get more information about, about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition or just go to their website. Their website was so impressed me because you see all of the teachers that teach their course and uh, you begin to recognize their names and you, and you realize that these are all sort of heroes in the holistic health field and you can't believe that you're going to be learning from them. Um, it's been a dream come true. Come true and I actually have had some of their teachers on the show already, and I'm going to have more. I've, I've, I've scheduled some to be on the show in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my message. Uh, I wanted to take the time to give you this information because I know that there are some listeners out there that are looking for this change now. And they're looking to shift their career to help people to that they genuinely want to make a difference. We want to shift the message from the old paradigm of wait till you get sick and then go to a doctor and get a pill to shifting our lifestyle. So we're living we're living the most authentic, healthy lifestyle possible 
so that we can have a, a life that is vibrant, that is full of energy. We can have health freedom, right? Don't we want to wake up feeling like we're 18 years old every day, no matter what? And we can have that. So if you want to have that for yourself, get a health coach. Definitely get an IAN health coach. If you want to learn how to do that so you can do it for yourself and help others, definitely check out taking the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's health coaching program. It's a certification program. I highly recommend it. And if you have any questions, absolutely feel free to email me. Excellent. Well, enjoy the rest of this interview. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking like, so if someone said, um, I want to clean my house. My habit is I want to, I want to, I want to, I, wanna, I you know what? I don't spend enough time cleaning my house. I've, I've kind of let it go. I want to clean my house. So if cleaning house is a habit, that's not specific enough because they could be like, okay, it, I said at 9 a.m. every day, I'd clean my house. And what do I do? Should I start with the bathroom? Okay. What if I'm going to do the bathroom? What should I clean in the bathroom? Like that's just too much willpower being used up in terms of choice. Cause then obviously we're going to choose the things we like doing and maybe avoid the things we don't like doing or use up a bunch of willpower doing something we don't like to do. So what you're saying is instead of saying clean the house is a new habit, you would say maybe like choose doing laundry as the, as the new habit. And then once you've mastered that, then go to, okay, I'm going to scrub the toilets as, and, and build that as a habit. And then, okay, I'm going to do the dishes and that's a separate habit. So break it down. And so it's measurable, specific, you can do it at a certain time and it becomes triggered in your life. Like, like after I eat, I automatically clean the dishes. I didn't even think about it. It just became a habit. So is that what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. So I want a cleaner house. So when I'm finished with dinner, when I get up, I'm going to put my dish in the dishwasher. When I get home from work and I grab the mail, I'm going to sort the mail right there. I'm going to spend, I'm going to do my laundry every Saturday morning, right? So you have to be very specific on what you're doing and when you're going to do it. But how many new habits can I, can I build at a time to, to make it into the neurons? So it just happens like, so it just really ingrains in my neurology. So ideally, so we have weekly, we have daily habits. We have weekly habits. We have monthly habits. It's easiest to create a daily habit so that you don't have to remind yourself, oh, yeah, it's Saturday. I have to do this. So if you know that every day when I get home from work, I'm going to spend 15 minutes cleaning and organizing, and then you have a list of options that that could mean. It could mean that I organize the mail. It could mean that I do a load of laundry. It could mean that I do this. If you can build in the habit of having cleaning time and then removing the choice or limiting the choice so that it's very clear, like, here's the list of things I can choose from. This is what I'm doing today. And then you mark it off. And then, you know, the next time I do this one, that will limit your choice and make it easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those who obviously they have health goals because this is <laughs> health podcast. Um, so for those who found it really hard to figure out how to get exercise into their life, what are some ways that we can make sure that this becomes a habit? Well, you know what? I'll share what worked for me. I never exercised ever. Um, and I have found um, through a little bit of trial and error because it is a trial and error. It's a little bit of art and a little bit of science figuring out what really works for your personality, what works for your schedule. Um, the reality of your daily life is different than my daily life. But for me, I have to exercise first thing in the morning because if I don't do it first thing in the morning, I won't do it. Things come up. I forget. I make excuses. And then it's nighttime before I know it. So I've just learned that for me, I wake up in the morning and I have my workout clothes uh, right next to my bed. And sometimes I will even sleep. I used to sleep in uh, what I worked out in. I don't do that. I don't have to do that anymore, but I have my workout clothes right there. I put them on, I go into the bathroom and I brush my teeth and then I do my exercise for the day. Mm -hmm. That's what worked for me. Now you could decide, all right, I want to exercise at lunch. This is a good time for me. I want to exercise when I get home from work. Um, so it's finding um, kind of the time frame that's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. But but we kind of lose up our willpower. So it's is it harder to make habits happen and stick in the evening versus the morning? 
Well, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, because so let's move on to step two, which is finding your trigger. Um, and because everybody's schedules are different, um, finding different triggers uh, can work. And, and they're not necessarily requiring more willpower. It's just the trigger. So like we said, uh, a trigger is something that tells you it's time to launch into a particular behavior. Mm -hmm. Mornings, lunchtime, home from work, and bedtime tend to be times in our life that are pretty routine oriented. They're pretty much one habit leading to the next. The easiest place to see this is in your morning. Your alarm clock is a trigger that says it's time to do something. Well, what is that? Depends. Are you the sort of person who presses the snooze button or do you pop right out of bed in the morning? Probably it's whatever you did the day before because that's your habit, right? And then I go, the first thing I do after I get a bed is I brush my teeth. But my husband wants a cup of coffee first, right? So looking at your schedule in these particular time frames, what am I, what is my routine in the morning? What is my routine at lunch? How about when I get home from work or leave work, kind of that time frame and before bed? Where in this category am I going to put it? So let's say you decide it's a morning habit. Now, looking through that routine, and, and you're going to want to pay attention to what you're doing because these habits are so ingrained, we don't even realize. So we can kind of look back and say, okay, well, I brush my teeth, and then I take a shower, and then I do this. But as you start to pay attention, you're going to become aware of all of these different triggers um, that you have. So now you look within your routine specifically. I wake up. I brush my teeth. Um, I take a shower, I eat breakfast, I get dressed, I leave for work. That's my routine. Okay, so where in that routine am I going to place this new habit? I'm going to exercise. I can do it as soon as I get out of bed. Um, I can do it after I brush my teeth. Uh, probably wouldn't make sense to do it before you shower. Uh, but what you're looking for is you want one habit to trigger the next because I encourage people not to necessarily use the alarm on your phone. The reality is, is you don't have to set an alarm on your phone to remind yourself to take, have your morning cup of coffee, right? Because you're being triggered. I walk into the kitchen at this time of day. It's time to make coffee. This is what I do. You want your habit to become like that. It's just part of your routine. The other problem with setting an alarm on your phone is that sometimes our mornings unfold slightly differently depending on like things that are going on. So mm -hmm. it might take you a little longer and now your alarm rings on your phone and you're like, oh, but I can't do it now because I'm in the middle of this thing and then you won't do it. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to rely on our phone. You want to trigger it with a particular action. So here's another example. If you wanted to take supplements, you could put your vitamins in your coffee mug. So when you go to make coffee, you take your mug out and you're like, oh, I have to take my vitamins. <laughs> that I'm is the triggered. best tip I have ever heard. <laughs> right? Because you can't drink your coffee until you take your supplements. Okay. And then and then you have to drink water, right? So now now you're getting automatically getting more water in you and you got your supplements in you before you ever had your coffee. And because so you don't have to think about it, right? Because you haven't had your coffee yet. So you don't have to think about it. You just go, oh, yeah, I got to take these. All right. Get a big glass of water. Take my supplements. Get my coffee. Have breakfast. Boom. It's happened. I love it. I love that. Yep, that's exactly right. And then I want to I want to share one of my favorite strategies um, for doing these habits because some mornings you're gonna wake up and you're like, okay, well I I exercise after I do this, and some days you're gonna say. I don't want to, I don't have time, I'm too tired, I don't feel good, right? There's always going to be these days where you're going to talk yourself out of it. So you want to create a what I call a minimum requirement. And the minimum requirement is a tool you use for those days when you're not going to do it. And your response to yourself is, you know what, that's okay, you only have to do this. So what is the smallest, tiniest step that you can take that is going to layer another strand on that pathway? Because it's not about intensity. It's not about duration. It's the simple act of doing it that builds your neural pathway. So you just want to keep that fire alive. So what if it was one minute of exercise, mm. right? Can you do one minute of exercise every single day? No matter mm -hmm. what, no excuses. Absolutely. One minute anybody can do. So you wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't want to. That's okay. I only have to do one minute. 
I only have to do one minute. I only have to take one sip of water. I'd only have to write one sentence in my journal. I only have to throw away one piece of mail, right? Whatever it is, it's the tiniest thing that you can do, but will keep the fire alive. Got it. Got it. Because sometimes people throw out the whole thing, right? Like I like, oh, I have a flat tire, so I'm going to get it in my car and slash the other three. Like, oh, I missed three days of the gym. Well, I, you know, screw it. Yep. Or, yep. oh, I, you know, I, you know, whatever they, they fell off the bandwagon. So they just give up. Right. And what you're saying is like, is like, if you just get in there and, and that, that happened to me the other day in the gym, I was just done. I did not. And it wasn't like, I wasn't physically done. I was mentally checked out. I didn't have the mental capacity or the emotional capacity to exercise. I just wanted to go play with my son, but I was already in the gym. And I did that. I said to myself, okay, you're just going to get on this for 15 minutes. You don't have to do your full workout. You don't have to get on all the, you know, do them all the weights. You're just going to do a minimum. And, and I kind of felt you know, I was beating myself up, but I was going, you know what, you're going to do something. You're here. You're going to do something. And I love that you said that because I could have beat myself up a lot less <laughs> if yeah. I gave myself like a permission, right? Like, yeah. you know what, get yourself to the gym. No, you know, as long as you're not like, you know, contagious, get yourself to the gym. If you're feeling kind of icky and, and do, and do 10 minutes, you know, and don't, don't push yourself, but get yourself into the routine. Because if you can keep the routine of going to the gym, if the gym is what you want, if it's walking, you know, like, like put on your sneakers and, and just, just walk, walk, you know, down the street and back, you know, like five, five minutes, or like you said, one minute, if we can just keep that routine going, keep the fire going in our really off days, then it's going to help the neural pathways so that when we, when we're on really good days, we can really like pump it up to our fullest. Yeah. And so on those days, this was a success that you just described to me, actually, that was a success. That's huge. So celebrate that and use this as a tool because this is, this is the fact of life, right? We are, our brains are going to talk us out of it some days and we just need a tool to keep it going. The hardest part sometimes is just inertia. It's like, oh, well, I have to, I have to put on my shoes. And you're like, you know, once you put on your shoes and you're out the door, sometimes that minimum requirement comes into like, oh, okay, well, I'll finish my walk now, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you just need a little boost. And for those days where it's not, I just need a little boost is I really don't have time or I really am not feeling good, then that's okay. You laid another filament on that pathway. That's a success. Mm. Mm -hmm. Describe this, the filament and the pathway so that people can get a visual of, of, of what is our brain actually doing when we have a habit and when we're installing a new one. So in your brain is that neural pathway, right? It, it launches when you start something and it ends when you finish it. And all along that pathway, those neurons are firing. But when you keep repeating that action, the brain gets more familiar with the action, fewer neurons fire. So it truly is repetition is the mother of habit. You keep repeating it. You take that same path. It's like wearing the grass down, right? You know, if you keep walking that same pathway through the grass, eventually the grass gets flattened and then it dies back. And now you have a pathway there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what you're doing is you're just making it deeper. You're putting the groove in there. And, and it's through the act of repetition. Got it. So like if going to the gym for, or going and exercising for one minute was just walking down that, that field of grass once, uh, that still is helping. If we go do our full workout, that's like walking back and forth kind of, you know, it's like really like solidifying it. And if we do it every day, that's solidifying it further. So if we can visualize that we're, we're creating a new path in this field of grass and then in, in our minds. And so over time then it just becomes natural habit. Yes. And, and add to that, that it, the act of repetition is more important than length or duration. So you could absolutely create the habit of going to the gym by driving to the gym, walking into the gym, getting changed, getting on uh, an elliptical machine for one minute and leaving and then do that because you know what, just getting yourself to the gym, that's actually very difficult, right? So you're building that neural pathway first. Like here's my habit as I go to the gym. I know how I drive there. I know where I park. I know where I go in and how I get changed. Like 
you start building that neural pathway by repeating it. And then you repeat, then you build the exercise neural pathway by exercising. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, gonna- so, so there's more, it's, it, there's multiple habits. It's like micro habits, right? There's, it's not, cause like I said, cleaning the house that there's actually tons of little habits that are unconscious within. So there's tons of little neural pathways that are firing off this unconscious program within the, um, realm of cleaning the house. We have habits within habits within habits. They're just so enmeshed. We don't even notice them. Got it. Now, so we've talked about the trigger and the action and and what about this reward? Yes. So that is step four is to identify your reward and you get a reward for completing any habit. I mean, even the worst habits, even the ones where you're like, oh my God, why am I doing this? You're doing it for a reason. But unfortunately, the rewards of new healthy habits are long term. So we know that, you know, if I exercise regularly, I'm going to be healthier, I'm going to get better sleep, I'm going to have more energy, I'm going to have better sex, like there are all of these amazing benefits to exercising. But those results are not going to kick in for some time and willpower is just not going to be enough to get us through that until those rewards start kicking in. So we want to hijack the brain's reward process because when we reward ourselves, chemicals go off in the brain right? Mm -hmm. And your brain associates these chemicals to the last thing that you just did. So when you do your action and you reward yourself over and over again, you create a mental physical connection to this action. And when you don't do it, your brain starts to go, you know what? Something feels wrong here. I'm missing something. Oh, would you go do this so that I can have my reward? So Mm. your brain and your body can become a partner in the habit creation process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are three different kinds of rewards. There are physical rewards. Now, physical rewards are where you're either engaging your body with physical activity or you're causing physical reactions in your body. So let's take those two separately, a physical activity. And this is not exercise because exercise is work. You're forcing yourself to do it. This has to be physical activity that you love doing. It feels good. So you could pump your fist in the air. You know, you could do like a little booty shake or if you have like a victory dance that you do, shake a pom-pom, jump up and down, but something, move your body in a way that is enjoyable to you. So that's the first way that you can use a physical word. The second way is that you can cause a physical reaction in your body. For example, You can have a cup of coffee or tea or a smoothie, a piece of candy. You could have breakfast after you do your habit because for better or worse, food is always a reward, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be food. Um, It could be a hot shower. It could be a pampering ritual like you get to wash your face. Um, It could be something simple like brushing your teeth because Brushing your teeth did not actually take off in this country until they added that tingly feeling to toothpaste. They were trying to sell toothpaste to people, selling them on the fact that you will have gum or disease-free gums and teeth. But what really did it is they put the tingly feeling in it and now it felt clean. That, that We miss that when we don't do it. That's a physical reward. And a lot of the habits we have in our lives that are the hardest to break, they are these habits with these strong physical responses. That's why we're so addicted to our morning cup of coffee, smoking, right? And drugs, they deliver this rush of nicotine into our body. So we want to use that to our advantage by choosing something that's good for us, but is also going to cause a physical reaction in our body. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so funny about, you know, marketing. It really, if you can study the history of marketing, it's it, you see how much manipulation and they're really util- utilizing how our brain works against us and for, for them, obviously, so they get the sale. But um, it's funny that like we didn't want to you when we saw the marketing around toothpaste because you know the the long-term benefits are less gun gum disease like who cares right but I mean 
there are people that care, but majority of people would still forget to brush their teeth every day. And then, and then it's like, well, you know, people are going to like you and that girl's going to like you. That guy's going to like you. You're going to have better sex. Um, your boss isn't going to fire you. You know, you're not going to be ostracized because you have bad breath, you know? And so, so they, when they put the, the immediate pros and cons right out there um because sometimes people are motivated by pleasure and uh, everyone's motivated by pleasure but there's also people that are additionally motivated by moving away from pain um the instant pain so the pain of the social ostracization or um or not being able to have that sex right so it can be it can be a negative and a positive um and and that in in that regard, then it became much easier to make that a healthy habit, right? It absolutely, yeah. So you've already hit on the other two rewards. We have emotional rewards. Uh, so these are things that kind of feel good, personally rewarding to us. So if you're the sort of person who loves checklists and loves checking things off of checklists, you can put it on your checklist. You could listen to a great song. You could write a gratitude list. If you do your habit, maybe it means you get to spend ten minutes reading a book or watching a TV show or even taking a nap that could work well for like, say uh, weekend habits where you're like, I need to clean. And then I want some me time, right? Um, you could put a small deposit into a vacation fund. So, you know, you can get one of those glass jars and after you do your thing, you put the money in there and you hear the clink and you see it start to pile up, right? Find something that is emotionally rewarding to you. Now, what about, can you do something emotionally rewarding at the same time as a habit? Like, I love to stream something I really want to watch while exercising. Uh, and I and that makes the hour go by super fast because I just, I consumed like a health lecture, like TED Talks or things like that, that I like, I, to I totally geek out on. So can you do, can you do it during the habit or does it have to be at the completion of the habit? Or, or technically, I guess the habit of going to the gym was then rewarded by watching the streaming while I exercised. Yeah, you can absolutely do it that way. Um, with the caveat is that if you don't do it, you don't get the reward, right? Uh -huh. So you don't get to listen to that or watch that TV show if you don't actually exercise. Mm, got it. Right? So the, what I did for exercising was showering because I love showering. It's like seriously like one of my favorite things. I love to take a shower. I could not shower if I hadn't already exercised. Right? Oh. So that and then we have social rewards. So social rewards, um, well, we know social rewards from Facebook, right? You know how many billions of people are logging into Facebook every single day, mm -hmm. right? We're addicted to that social reward. So you can't get on Facebook until you do your thing. You get to spend 15 minutes on Facebook. Uh, you could just call a friend and say, hey, I just want to let you know I, you know I did this thing and they can support you. Um, you can use your Fitbit. The Fitbit will let you check in with other people. So that's a form of social reward. So you're finding a way to engage other people. Social rewards are very powerful. And if you can overlap these rewards, the stronger it becomes. So mm. if you're exercising, you could mark a calendar, right? But or mark off your checklist, but just don't walk over to that checklist like, eh, it's no big deal. You walk over that checklist using your body, right? So you're going to walk over with your chest back, your shoulders back, and you check it off and you pump your fist in the air. Um, and then get on Facebook and brag about your success. Like I just completed my habit today, right? So layer them and it'll make it even more powerful. Mm. Yeah. You know, what I've seen on Facebook is that I've, I've seen this kind of go through a few times, um, been on Facebook long enough that people will, will announce that they're doing, you know, a, a whole month of gratitude and they'll, they'll, every day they'll get on Facebook and, and they'll list like five things they're grateful for, or 10 things they're grateful for, and they'll do it every day. So there's that in their social, right. And, mm -hmm. and then there's a, 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 you know, because listing something you're grateful for every day has so many benefits on an emotional and mental level, just huge benefits, um, to getting us out of depression and getting, getting all those healthy, um, 
healthy feel good hormones going and decreasing mm-hmm. stress and so so there's that they're doing the habit they're getting the social right away so that's and, and I see them do it and then they have to post every day no matter how they feel about something positive and what they really are grateful for in their life every day for x amount of days and then they challenge their friends to do the same and and so it kind of cycles through um, and people always say that they feel so amazing at the end of making that a habit yep yeah that's a great example. Very, very cool. And so the other thing that I think you, you just hit on that I'd like to kind of explore further is this idea of gratitude as a habit. Because what I have found is like, okay, we are programming ourselves to do certain things. We better choose these certain things very carefully. Um, and so I've identified seven fundamental habits. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about those. Okay. So habit number one is physical health, right? We have to take care of our physical health. It's what drives us in this world. But I like to just kind of qualify this about what I mean when I say physical health. What I mean is being physically active every single day, eating healthy foods, getting enough sleep and drinking enough water. And what I don't mean is being skinny because being skinny All it does is it tells you how much gravity is exerted on your body. It doesn't tell you if you're healthy. It doesn't tell you if you're a good person or a bad person. It definitely doesn't tell you how much willpower you have. And people have to know that their weight is not just impacted by diet and exercise, but also by genetic, biological, digestive behaviors that they don't necessarily have control over. But you can create a habit of being physically active every day, choosing good foods, getting enough sleep and drinking enough water. So Mm -hmm. those are the four physical health habits. Wonderful. Great habits to have. Habit number two is mindfulness. Where physical, where the body's natural state is to be still, we have to move it. The mind's natural state is to move. So to exercise our mind, we have to still it. So mindfulness um, is a very important habit that can mean meditation, but there are other mindfulness practices um, that people can incorporate. Habit number three is relationships because the quality of our life is directly related to the quality of our relationships. So have good relationship habits, being a good listener, keeping your promises. Like these are all relationship habits that we can develop. Habit number four is connecting with yourself because one of the most important habits that you have is the one that or the mo- one of the most relate important relationships you have is the one that you have with you. So the right habits will help you feel more confident, nurture your spirituality. Um, so you want to make a habit of connecting with yourself on a regular basis. Habit number five is gratitude. Uh, Gratitude is a simple affirmation of goodness, but it recognizes that that goodness came from someplace outside of you. Um, And so saying thank you is a grateful act, but you can be a habitually grateful person who just looks at the world as a source of goodness. And you've already hit on some of the amazing benefits that uh, gratitude brings in our lives. University of California, Berkeley has documented in like hundreds of studies, uh, grateful people get more sleep, they feel more rested, grateful people recover from traumatic situations more quickly. It uh, reduces feelings of pain. It Um, reduces inflammation. Like there are so many physical and emotional benefits to gratitude. And this is one, uh, along with physical health, gratitude, these are keystone habits. When you start feeling more grateful, it impacts your life in ways you can't even anticipate when you start it. And then we have habit number six, which is simplicity. And simplicity is, I like to tell people, it's not about not being busy. It's not about not buying stuff. What it is, it's about directing your resources, whether that's time, energy, space, money, directing those resources to the people, the places, the activities that bring you the most joy, that help you accomplish your goals. And, and feeling free not to focus on anything else, right? Being able to say no and focus your energy on what's most important to you. And then habit number seven uh, is philanthropy. And for me, philanthropy is where the rubber meets the road. It really is where the tongue in our mouth lines up with the tongue in our shoe. 
if we want to make the world a better place, then we have to do something about it. And philanthropy is you doing something about what you believe in to make this world a better place. And it is not about how much you give. It's about how you give. So philanthropy is giving your time and money to causes you care about. And I call these the generosity habits because your best life happens when you balance giving to yourself and giving to others. And these habits make sure that you find that balance. Oh, wonderful. Now you have a book called 365 Ways to Live Generously, Simple Habits for a Life That's Good for You and for Others. Wonderful book. Highly recommend listeners check it out. The link to that and everything that Sharon does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast really quick because I know uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, tell us about your, your, your charity. It's so cool. Now you guys have raised over $50,000 for various charities that make a big difference in this world. Tell us a little bit about this and how we can plug in and, and be part of your philanthropy group. Uh, it's my labor of love. (laughs) I love it. Uh, so it's called, if you go to virtualgivingcircles.com, you can read about uh, what we do and how we do it, but it's pretty simple. You choose your cause. Am I, do I want to support veterans? Do I want to end poverty? Do I want to support pets? And when you become a member of the circle, you contribute $25 a month. And then we pool that money and we donate together as a group. So as a member, you might hear about a charity and you think, well, is this a good charity? I don't know. You submit the name. Uh, We research it, then we send out the reports, and then you get to vote. So if you like, uh, you read through the reports and you think this is the charity that's going to make the biggest difference with it, you vote for that one, and then we send them off our our larger set of money. So we donate about $1,200 every three months to each of these causes. It's awesome. I love it. Um, Did you know there's probably over a million charities in the United States Amazing. And a lot a lot of the bigger ones, though, I'm always worried that my money's never g- actually going to make a difference. And so I like that you guys are, are more like boutique charities that are really out there making a difference in people's lives, right? That's our goal. And it's totally member driven. So we have donated to large charities, but they go through the same research process. But it's also hard to know, you know, is this small charity? What are they doing? Um, but here's what I like to tell people. Why donate alone? You don't have to donate alone. Other people care about the same cause that you care about. And when we team up, we can do it a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively because we're sharing our resources. So we make giving easy. That's what we do. That's cool. And a bit social. Do the members get to kind of communicate with each other? Like, is it a Facebook group or do they get to in some way feel like they're interacting with the other people that care about the same cause as they do? Yeah, we get together once a month. Now, we always tell people, like, you are welcome to participate at any level. When, for some people, that means I just want to give you $25 a month, and that's it. Um, but we also we meet once a month, so we get together to kind of, like, check in on how things are going. Um, so you're welcome to participate in that. Uh, you're welcome to nominate charities. You're welcome uh, to vote on the charities at any level that people are interested in participating. And and it could be anyone around the world or do they have to be local to you? No, we uh, well, I started it when my husband was in the army and we were moving around quite a bit. So I knew that I couldn't do this locally because <laughs> I would move soon. Uh, so this is virtual. Um, we have members of um, all over the world. And yeah, so you can do it from where you are. Very cool. Now, tell tell us about your website. So SharonLipinski.com, of course, that's going to be in the show notes of today's podcast. Definitely want uh, listeners to go check out the Habit Toolbox, download the Habit Toolbox. You have shared with me everything that's in it um, off the air, and I was blown away. So, so listeners, definitely check that out, SharonLipinski.com. How can people like work with you or do they hire you to come in and and consult and and help their their um, business? Like how can people if they want to get coached by you or want you to coach their business? um, How does that work? Well, the best thing to do is to download the habit toolbox because I will let people know about upcoming courses coming up. So I actually have one coming up. So you have this course coming up this um, how to break the bad habits course, right? What's it called and, and when does it start? 
Well, it's called Breaking Bad Habits. It's this Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a webinar. Uh, so if you can attend it live, you can listen to it later. But if you can attend live, that's great because you can ask me questions based on you know your particular situation, what habit you are trying to break. And we're going to cover a few things. We're going to talk about what's triggering your habits because we know <laughs> we don't want to do it. And if we could choose it, we would stop. So what is causing you to automatically launch into these behaviors? We're going to go through my five-step system to break any bad habits. And it's different from what we went through in creating a habit because the process of breaking a bad habit is in reverse, right? The neural pathway already exists. And what we have to do is disrupt what's there. And then I'll go through 10 strategies that you can use because not all habits are created equal. Um, different habits, different bad habits require different strategies to disrupt. So I've got 10 strategies that you can use. And so that's this Saturday at 2 p.m. Wonderful. And how do they um, get, how do they gain access to that? They just go to SharonLipinski.com or should they email you? How, how do they um, get involved in your course? Well, I can give you a different link if that's okay. Great. Um, give, give me a different link. I'll put it in the show notes for the listeners. It's bestlifehabits.com slash bad dash habits. All right. That's going to go in the show notes of today's podcast, bad habits Ooh, and getting rid of them, right? We could do a whole, or a whole talk just on bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I think it's really important because, you know, at the end of the day, we could listen to every episode I've done and we could follow all these wonderful doctors. But if we don't build a habit, then we're just stuck listening and not doing and it's in the doing that's going to get us our health, right? That's absolutely right. We have all of these information, right? I remember like, I was like, why? I, I wanted to do that. Why didn't I do that? Right? We know what we need to do. We hear a good call. We hear all these things. And now we need to implement it. So, so use that habit anatomy. Help yourself hack into it. And, and then what my book does is because knowing that repetition is the mother of habit, each day you're practicing one of the generosity habits so that just easily, gently, consistently throughout the year, you're building these habits and, and it doesn't have to be hard. Um, it just needs to be consistent. So whatever you can do to make it consistent. That's the uh, way to go. Wonderful. All right. SharonLipinski.com or, or listeners can go to LearnTrealth.com and check out the show notes of today's podcast to gain access to all the links that uh, Sharon Lipinski has and the toolbox uh, for the habit toolbox to download. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Definitely want to have you back. Um, I love the work that you're doing, especially the philanthropy work. Um, I think that's a, a lot of fun because I've always been hesitant about donating money because I just did, don't know if my dollars are actually going to make a difference. And um, and so knowing that you get together as a group, you as a group research with the with the charity does and the work it does. And and then as a group, you vote and then you know that you it's just twenty five dollars a month. Almost everyone can do that, uh, can afford that. But then as a group, you feel like you're making a really big difference. And doesn't that feel good to know that you're making a difference in this world? It's my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Ashley. Thank you. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back. Please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to takeyoursupplements.com and you can support us that way. You'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com or join our membership, learntruehealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to learntruehealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? 
Go to LearnTrueHealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's TakeYourSupplements.com for wonderful supplements. LearnTrueHealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership, which is only open for a limited time. You can get our free healthy cookbook and you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you. Just go to LearnTrueHealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page. Thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others. Let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave. 